Okay, got it. Okay. okay, I stop share. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can see your screen. It's great. All right. So yeah, uh, so we'll shift to the next uh, presentation, the second part of um, Professor Kurt's presentation uh, that started yesterday. Uh, and that was related to uh, machine learning for physics discovery and controlling optical systems. So now it seems the title is a bit refined. Um, uh, we're shifting to deep learning, it seems. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. And uh, if you are ready, the, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Hi, guys. Uh, I know it's uh, later for you in Europe. And uh, you got, after this, you get to go to a nice dinner, maybe, or at least have a nice dinner. So. Um, so I, I changed the title slightly, but it's really just the same. It's all going to be about control. And I want to think about uh, deep neural nets and how we can use them in certain ways towards control. Um, in the last lecture, I talked about a lot of the targeted uses of neural nets for discovery of coordinates and dynamics and how you could use those together to get more interpretable models. Here, I'm going to give up a little bit on interpretability initially towards it, with the goal of just simply trying to stabilize optical systems from measurements and feedback from the system itself. Um, so this work, uh, what I'm gonna highlight is work that was done by Chang Sung, Thomas Baumeister, and my main collaborator here, Steve Brunton. And I'm actually gonna highlight a number of methods uh, that might be appropriate to some of you who do experiments. So I, I'm kind of a big fan that I don't think one technique works better than all of them. It's not like Lord of the Rings where there's one ring to rule them all, uh, it, at least not yet. But it, here it's more that uh, there are different techniques that do quite well under different circumstances. And I wanna highlight some of these and actually how we can use them in combination even to do some interesting things. So here's the goal. Uh, the goal is going to be about self-tuning of optical systems. So how do I use information collected from sensors or collected from uh, measurements of the system itself uh, towards thinking about using this towards uh, essentially self-tuning that photonic system? And I'm going to talk about specifically three different models. Uh, one is what's called extremum seeking control. The other one's uh, called deep model predictive control and deep reinforcement learning, right? So we put the word deep in there and then you get, uh, then people get more excited, it seems these days, because there's a neural network in it. So uh, although I think, uh, you know, model predictive control and just reinforcement learning by itself are just fine concepts, uh, there doesn't this have to be a deep portion of it. Um, okay, so I want to walk through these three and show you sort of how they work and show you that in fact, uh, they are actually taking advantage of a lot of the things that we would normally do anyway in terms of focus or uh, focusing our attention towards tuning these systems. So I'm gonna start here with what's called extremum seeking control. Uh, and extremum seeking control was really engineered or made for systems uh, that are nonlinear in which you can't down, write down an easy uh, linear control model. That's what normally people would do is write down some linear control model. But in this case, we wanna to go to a fully nonlinear system. And in, in nonlinear optics, that's what we're really dealing with is complex dynamics, strongly non, strong nonlinearities. How do you tune such systems? So the example system I wanna give is here, uh, mo a mode lock laser. Uh, so, you know, I, I worked in, mode in, in mo modeling of mode lock lasers for a while. And so it was a really nice toy system to demonstrate these concepts on. There's nothing special about mode locked lasers, except for that they're a really nice playground for trying to understand these architectures. Not only that, you can, you know, I don't do experiments, so I can simulate these mode lock laser systems very easily. You can do this all on a laptop. And most of the things I'm gonna talk about, all the code is available to you. So, right, you can just run this on your laptop. You don't need some big 
GPU clusters to do this. Uh, you can just do all of it uh, pretty simply on laptop level computing to just convince yourself of the kind of paradigms for doing this kind of control architectures in these systems. All right, so here's the example system. So what it is, right, is it's a, it's a mode lock laser. So it's a fiber laser. And the way that it's typically tuned, you, you, you bring in gain into the system. Uh, so you pump uh, energy into the system. You have an output coupler. And uh, importantly here, you have a set of wave plates, quarter wave plates, half wave plates, and a polarizer, which help create the mode lock state of the laser system. Essentially, the way that this laser works is through nonlinear polarization rotation, which it creates a wobble in the polarization state of the electric field. And if that wobbles frequency matches when it hits that polarizer, the polarizer lets the right polarization field through the polarizer and anything that's orthogonal to it uh, gets uh, attenuated. So essentially what happens is you start this thing from noise and out comes this very beautiful mode lock laser pulse, at least in certain parameter regimes for the wave plates and polarizers. Now I worked quite a while on this system with uh, doing modeling with this with Frank Wise. And so many of you know Frank Wise who's at Cornell and he builds these things. And one of the things that I always found fascinating is I'd go to Cornell to visit Frank and uh, you know, you would see the laser system and uh, his grad students would go in there and tune the laser by hand uh, every morning, right? And the really good grad students, in other words, the ones that were pretty mature, were well along in their PhD, they could tune the laser very rapidly, you know, within five to 10 minutes. And the first year grad students, it took them more like 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get this laser tuned to where it should be, right? And then maybe uh, by the middle of the day, the laser is no longer mode locking, and so you'd have to retune this thing. And so the question is, um, so first of all, what are the mechanisms of tuning? Because you have to change polarizers and wave plates to get this tuned, and also the gain dynamics. So there's a, a high dimensional input space. Um, but it seems that you could certainly automate this entire process, right? Why would the grad student need to go tune this thing when, in fact, if you look at what they were doing, you should be able to put servo drives on those wave plates uh, in polarizer and just have this thing tune itself. Really, there's no reason for this thing to be hand tuned um, if you can get yourself an algorithm that would do this for you. So that, that's exactly what we wanna go after with this is first of all, to tune it then, you need an objective function. So in other words, what does it mean for this laser to be operating well? And you have to identify what are the actuations. And at least for the laser, mode lock laser, these are easy to identify. The actuations are those wave plates and the polarizer. In other words, setting the angles of them. And the objective function is related to, in fact, the output of the laser cavity, which you can actually just look at a spectrum that comes out. And so we want to, you know, because normally it takes a lot more effort to look at the actual pole shape, but we can look at the spectrum very easily and the energy of that uh, in, the, in the laser cavity. So what extremum seeking can, control is going to do is going to start to learn how to use these features and these uh, have access to the actuations and this objective function to learn how to self-tune this. Okay, so let's talk first uh, about how this might happen. So here it is. This is, this is your actuation potential, right? You have the wave plate and polarizer. So you already have four dials. So, right, this is already a high dimensional space. So this is why it takes the really good grad students five to 10 minutes to do this because they're working around in a four dimensional parameter space. Uh, and so you still have to search for the solutions. And normally what happens is with good experience, you can learn how to do this very easily. Um, and why the, the first year grad students, it takes them time to learn this. So they might take 30 to 45 minutes to tune a four dimensional actuation space to get the, the mode lock states they want. So that's your actuation. As far as your objective function, let's talk about this. So for a mode lock laser, it's not just about producing a high output 
of light, so a lot of energy in the cavity. What you want is that energy to be organized. In particular, in mode locking, you want the energy to be organized into a ultra short pulse. In other words, the, what you want is some kind of spectral confinement, right? So you want this thing to have a nice, well, actually, you want a nice broad spectrum and so uh, of the pulse, and you want localized energy in that, in that uh, cavity. So what we found, and this was not obvious initially, but what we found was that if in fact you took the energy of the cavity and you divide it by the fourth moment of the spectrum, that turned out to be a great objective function for us. And in fact, what you're seeing here is a set of plots where the blue line and the red lines are in fact the energy or the spectral width and the black line is in fact the this objective function which is the energy over the fourth moment and what you see here in fact is that in the white regions those are the mode locking regimes and the gray regions is where the the cavity is not mode locked at all and so you have to be in this regime of the white region and in fact if we track this objective function you can find that if we divide by the fourth moment of the spectrum it in fact gives you those if you can see the little diamonds on top those are the optimal solutions that are achieved if, if you get the best mode locking state is right there. And notice that they are slightly away from the instability boundary, which is the gray region. This is really important. If you took this objective function and it was the energy divided by the second moment, the maximum solution, the best solution would be right at the boundary of an instability. So what would happen is a lot of these self-tuning algorithms would walk you up right to the maximum and then drop you off a cliff, right? Because your best performance is at the boundary. When you divide by the fourth moment, it gives you a cushion to the boundary, making it sort of a really a very nice uh, objective functions. And here again, I'm tuning this as a function of alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and alpha P. These are the wave plates and polarizers. And you can see there's regions where it's mode locked and lots of regions where it's not mode locked. And what you would like to do in this four dimensional space is have the algorithm learn how to get itself to the best performing solution possible by itself without you having to do that. Okay, so here's how extreme unseeking control works. And in fact, this is a very intuitive concept. So this is a data driven approach, but there is no machine learning in it in the classical sense, right? We're not having a learning algorithm. This is more just something that you might do if you were tuning the laser by hand. So there's the control diagram. You have the laser system. And what we essentially do is we modulate each of the wave plates and polarizers. So in other words, you wiggle where they are currently and you watch to see, did the objective function go up and down, up or down, depending upon if I wiggled it uh, left or right. And what you do is if I take a small wiggle and, it, and if I go to the right, it goes up, it goes to the left, it goes down, I take a small step to the right, right? Because that made the objective function get better. And I would do this with multiple inputs. So it's the three wave plates and the polarizers. I wiggle all of them. I essentially create a local gradient for the objective function. So what it allows you to do is take a step in the direction of the maximum. Now you take that step and then you wiggle again. You take another step. So what you do essentially with this is you hill climb. You walk up to the top of the objective function. And that's what's demonstrated there on the right is normally you have some local ma maxima of this objective function. And what you would really like to do is take these wave plates and polarizers and modulate them, find a gradient and walk up to the top of the hill. In other words, to the top of where the objective function is maximized. Now, once you're at the top, when you wiggle it, there's very little change in that objective function because in fact, the derivative is zero. And so that's exactly where you put the system and then you stay there. So this allows you to do control of strongly nonlinear systems. There's no linearizing approximation trying to make your mode lock laser be an x dot equals ax plus bu, because <coughs> this is in fact pretty strongly nonlinear. So this is in some sense an intuitive approach. This extreme of seeking control has been developed for these nonlinear systems sort of in the last, over the last uh, decade or two. 
And uh, so there's some really nice work on this kind of modeling paradigm. And it really is structured around, it basically climbs to the top of the biggest local uh, maximum of your objective function. So which of course can be problematic because I don't want just the local maximum, I want the global maximum for that laser cavity. So we need to address that next. Okay, so first of all, let me just uh, show you how this operates in practice if you were to do this. So here's the laser cavity. And what we've done with this laser cavity is an experiment numerically, which is very close to what actually happens in the laser cavity in, real, in the real world, which is the one unknown that's here is the biofringence. The fiber biofringence is unknown. It's a single realization of some stochastic process, which is the polarization uh, uh, orientation around the fiber cavity. And it changes if you bend the fiber, it changes during the day, due to temperature fluctuations. And so what happens is during the course of the day, just because the lab gets warmer or gets colder, the laser will mode lock or go out of mode locking. So what we decided to do is let's let the biofringence do a random walk, okay? So we don't know what the biofringence is, but on the right there in the middle panel, you see that what we allowed the biofringence to do is take some stochastic random walk. Now, what happens to the laser cavity is it goes in and out of mode locking. In fact, on the top right figure, you can see the red line shows you the performance when the control is off. So in other words, it dips in performance, then it's mode locked, then it dips in performance, then it mode locks. So as the biofringence wanders, it comes in and out of mode locking, which is exactly what happens in the lab. And you don't know, what to, you don't know how to measure the biofringence. So what we do instead is say, okay, let's go ahead and turn this controller on. Let's let it have access to modulating the wave plates and polarizers to create a local gradient and then watch this thing self tune. So what it's gonna do is basically create a local gradient, walk up into a mode lock state. And as the biofringence changes, this extremum seeking control adjust the wave plates and polarizers to keep it mode locked. So in the top right, the black line is when you have the control on. So all of a sudden you've stabilized this mode lock laser cavity so that it's completely stable despite this wandering biofringence. So for instance, in, in the Frank Wise lab, you could say, okay, once this is on, if you turn this laser on in the morning, it will stay mode locked all day. In fact, for days straight because the laser itself makes corrections and adjustments to keep it into the mode lock state. By the way, the actual evolution of the wave plates and polarizers is given in the bottom right. You can see how they're actually changing their angles to keep it in the mode lock state. So this is a very nice framework for doing a stabilization of a mode lock laser and keeping it stabilized. But of course, what we really need to do is we have to decide instead of just walking up to the local maximum, I'd like to actually understand the landscape of the different places where it's mode locked. And then how can I set this up so that I get to the best cavity performance, not just a local maximum of the cavity performance. And so what we do here is we start to build libraries of the behavior. So now we're getting into the machine learning framework, which is to learn feature spaces for the behavior of the laser cavity. So what you're looking at here is a toroidal search. So what we can do is we can essentially search by changing the, the orientations of the wave plates and the polarizers. And in fact, we change them in such a way that they are irrationally related in frequency so that we can actually sample a torus, some higher dimensional torus, which allows us to construct the objective function in and map it out for the entire state space of the different wave plates and polarizers. Now, this is tr traditionally a four dimensional space, right? Because I have the three wave plates and the polarizer. And I've shown you just mapping for two of the dimensions. So suppose alpha one, alpha two. And what you're seeing there is the red spots is where it's mode locked. And the blue spots, it's where it doesn't, isn't mode locked. So I need to be in one of those reds. And the question is, which red is going to give me the very best performance out of this landscape of just this, even this two parameters? But now, of course, I've got to do it over 
a four-dimensional torus. And so what we can do is we can do this uh, toroidal sweep of the entire laser cavity. Let's call this the learning phase of the laser cavity. So you would put a laser cavity on, it would do this toroidal sweep, march through all the parameter spaces. The nice thing is the, the dynamics, the laser cavity either mode locks immediately or never modes locks. And so you can actually do this sweep, let's say in the orders of tens of minutes. Now, once you've learned the landscape, you actually know where all the peaks of performance are and so what you can do is find those peaks and go actually place your laser system close to one of those peaks and then use extreme of seeking to walk up this thing. So here is, uh, you also have to make sure you don't get aliasing. You wanna sample that torus at a fine enough rate so that you can get all the local minima and maxima, okay? So here is just showing some sampling strategies as we refine the search. And in fact, on the bottom there, that the blue, middle bottom middle panel in the blue you can see that we've refined it enough to find in fact the local maxima which if we blow that out it's the bottom right figure there which shows you that objective function in that narrow white window where mode locking actually occurs and that is in fact the best mode lock state you can achieve in this laser cavity so we want to find that so that essentially we can get ourselves near it and then use extreme seek and control to stay on it or to improve our, or to walk up to the local peak there. Okay, so here's the biggest problem, by the way, it's the birefringence. So even if I do this sweep, this sweep that I've done of the landscape only holds for a very specific value of the birefringence, but the birefringence in the morning when the lab is cooler is different than the birefringence in the afternoon when the lab is warmer. So uh, this is a really sensitive parameter and it completely changes the lo uh, mode locking behavior. So the other question we can ask is, how am I gonna handle this parametric dependency on the birefringence? So again, we can use uh, this library building technique. And what we can do is we can actually look at different behaviors under different birefringences. So we can compute the objective function and what we do with the objective function as we sweep through the toroidal search, we can do it at different conditions. For instance, in a warm lab, a cold lab, with a fiber bent like this, fiber bent like that. So in other words, each of these configurations would have a different average birefringence. And what we can do with this is we can carry a spectrogram of that objective function. And that's what's shown there on the bottom. And what's interesting about this, this becomes a fingerprint that helps identify this specific value of birefringence. And so we can build fingerprints for all the different birefringences. And then what all we got to do now is when we turn the laser on, we have to first start sweeping through our objective function in order for us to classify what the, what the birefringence value is. And once we have the right birefringence values, then you can look it up on a map and see, oh, for this birefringence, Here's where the local, where the max, where the global maxima is. You can put yourself near there. Use extreme and seeking control to keep yourself there. So it's this three-step process: is classify the birefringence, find, go to your library of learned maximal behaviors, find where you should be, and then walk yourself up. So here's how it actually works, sort of in practice. There's a training stage, and the training stage is all about mapping out, doing these toroidal searches for different birefringence values. So once you have that training data, the execution stage is now it's using the features you learn from the training to essentially allow yourself to identify the birefringence, go find yourself then the local maximal peak, walk over there and then use extreme seeking control to stay on that peak for, for from then on. So that's kind of the idea. It's It's actually What's interesting is the training isn't even that long, right? So when we talk about machine learning training, there are a lot of algorithms out there. Like uh, I went to a machine learning conference where the keynote speaker casually said, well, you know, uh, I put the code out. You can train this on 120 20 GPUs for two months. And of course, uh, that's a long time. This isn't two months. This is training in a lab. You could do this within a lab in, uh, in in five to 10 minutes. 
So that's a big difference between like these kind of uh, amazing claims of like, you know, two months on 120 GPUs. This is five to 10 minutes, one GPU. Okay, so it's really, uh, it's actually something you could do in practice. Okay, so this is one paradigm for establishing control. Notice that all, all the machine learning is up in the training stage where it learns uh, the objective function landscape and classifies the buyer fringence. Those are the two pieces. And once you have that, then you can do the extremum seeking control to find the best solution. Let's move on from this because there are new and other emerging techniques also for control. And the one we're gonna talk about here is deep model predictive control. So model predictive control is sort of your, uh, the state of the art control paradigm that people are working with today, which is you have a model, that's the M in the model predictive control. And you take that model and you create a forecast. In other words, you create a, a short time prediction. So that's the P, the model predictive. And then you make a control decision based on optimizing all the control inputs that would help if you have, if you have a, a, a predicted trajectory and you want your trajectory to go in a different direction, what are the, you optimize over all the possible control inputs to get you onto the trajectory you need to be on. And what deep model predictive control does is it starts to actually just learn these patterns so that in fact, your model itself is some kind of deep neural network architecture doing a forecast for you essentially. So here's how deep learning control works. Again, we're going to place this all in the context of the mode lock laser, but you know, it's fairly generic. You can apply it on anything if you want, right? I mean, really at this, these kind of architectures, we've done this uh, now for a rocket engine. We've done it for like, there's just everything I'm telling you here ports to other systems, but everything here is very generic. So you can port it across different photonic systems. The main thing is you have to ask the question, do I have a good objective function? In other words, what am I trying to achieve out of that laser? And what are my actuations? And we've already established that we have a good uh, objective function, which is this energy divided by the fourth moment of the spectrum. That's our objective. And our control inputs are the values of uh, how I tune my wave plates and polarizers. And so what we're gonna learn here is a couple things. First. We're going to build a model predictor. That's at the bottom right there, that part D. Um, if the air is above a certain amount, we got to go build, do a model prediction. And from that model prediction, we make, we learn a, uh, we optimize for a control decision. And we are in this loop. Uh, and the other thing we have to do is we have to learn a latent variable representation of the biofringence. Again, this is an unknown quantity, but it has huge impact on the laser. So just like what we had to do previously, which is learn some kind of library of behaviors of the biofringence, this deep learning control will learn some kind of mapping and some kind of representation of this latent rep variable, which is the biofringence, something that you can't measure and that it's a stochastic, it's random from fiber to fiber. Okay, so there's many photonic systems that have a variable like the biofringence and so we're going to handle it by building a model for it and, and having a mapping for it. So here's where it gets a bit complicated. But basically what this is built out of is this LSTM type modules, so long-term, short-term memory modules, which is just basically learning a forecast. And so the architecture looks a bit complicated, but really at the end of the day, this is sort of a, almost a a little bit standard in machine learning is to use some of these. And Aurelio talked about some of these LSTMs, I believe yesterday <coughs> and recurrent neural nets yesterday as well. And so we use sort of these high-end lifting models that essentially uh, you're gonna try to do a forward prediction with the LSTM and you're gonna train this through back, back propagation. Okay, so you're gonna learn this as this is your forecasting tool. That is your model predictive control. Okay, or that's your model for making a prediction. Okay, you're also gonna have to learn some kind of mapping for the biofringence. So in other words, there's a parametric dependency for this forecast. And that parametric dependency depends upon the biofringence. So you can learn a representation 
for the dynamics of the of the or for the dependency, the parametric dependency of the buyer, for instance, itself. So we train a separate model which is this mapping of the of the biofringence space into this forward prediction model that's trained through backpropagation. Okay? So this is a completely, you know, this is like black box. You know, yesterday I talked a lot about pulling out interpretable models. In some sense here, uh, I've given up on that. I'm building just representations of a forecasting engine that's parametrized by this biofringence. Now, of course, I know it's the biofringence, but this thing is simply taking measurements and it's learning that there is some parametric dependency that has to account for. It doesn't know that it's called biofringence, but it learns this representation. And in fact, I wanna just show you this. This is the output of that latent variable learner. So what you're seeing in blue is the actual biofringence changes I made to the cavity. This laser system, which has no concept of biofringence, it's like sort of a black box, it learns that green line. It says there is some variable here. And my prediction is that this is what it's doing. Look how well that blue and green match. So it had no concept of a biofringence, but it pulled out essentially something that tracks your biofringence almost perfectly from the data. So this is really encouraging. So I, cause I just made the comment that we've kind of given up on interpretability, but here it's actually giving you back an interpretable piece of information, which is these are your stochastic fluctuations or close to it of the biofringence. And the second latent uh, sample, by the way, the, the blue, the, the gray line back there, it also pulls out noise. In other words, it sort of does a decomposition Here's the signal and here's noise. So uh, it's remarkable. We were quite impressed with this. This I kind of couldn't believe that it had no information, had no way to understand there was even a bifurcation variable, uh, a biofringence variable, and it pulled it right out. So by the way, we can ex now once you have, you need a lot of data for this, by the way. So let's 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 be honest about deep learning here, right? So deep learning requires uh, a lot of data. So we have a lot of data for this, uh, but once you have a lot of trajectory data, you can train this thing with that model that I just showed you. And here is in fact, the, um, the deep model predictive control in action. So what you're seeing here in the middle panel, the blue, this is the stochastic variations in biofringence over some long time. And we asked the question, what would happen to the laser cavity if we didn't have any control? Well, at the very top, I show you the objective function and the red line is what happens if you don't have any control. It basically comes in and out of mode locking. So it's close to mode locking and then drops out of mode locking. It comes back onto mode locking. This is exactly what we're trying to get around is having this thing mode lock and then go out of mode locking, come back into mode locking, just simply because there's some variable that's the biofringence, which is changing around underneath. So the blue, uh, sorry, the green line on the top is when you turn this controller on, notice that what it does, it stabilizes the laser cavity operation. So now all of a sudden just keeps that objective function, keeps it mode locked. And what it does is it has access to the wave plates and polarizers. And in the bottom picture there, the bottom panel, you see how the wave plates and polarizers are changing over time to keep this thing mode locked, okay? So this is deep model predictive control in action. Okay, one last paradigm. So I've given you extremum seeking control, which relied on machine learning in the sense of building a feature space libraries behaviors, deep model predictive control, which takes trajectories and it learns a representation of for forecasting those trajectories and then a representation of the underlying latent variables, which is the biofringence. And the final one is reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is, is about as, as close as you get to how humans in some sense learn, right? Which is we learn through trial and error and gathering rewards, okay? And so this is exactly what we're gonna do now is take the same cavity. And here is our third paradigm, which is we're gonna compute, we're gonna allow the system to change the wave plates and polarizers and basically try different actions and to see 
what actions cre create the greatest reward? And the reward is the integrated objective function over time. Okay, so you know, you you now instead of just looking at the instantaneous state of the system, you look at a path of the system. So what we're looking for is pathways towards the mode lock state. And so what again you do is you have the objective function, which is very clear, it's the same as it's been, actuation with the wave plates and polarizers. But now the deep reinforcement learning uh, engine collects rewards for lots of trials where essentially the algorithm is allowed to explore. So that's kind of exactly how this works. So it basically takes different trajectories. Some of them give you almost no reward. And then some of them have a great reward. And so it starts to characterize and collect all of these different trajectories. In other words, how do I change the wave plates and polarizers? And I want to change those in such a way that gives me the largest reward structure, because that's usually, that means I've mode locked the laser system. So you go through a training cycle and the training cycle here would be basically turn your laser on, allow the algorithm access to the wave plates and polarizers and allow it to do a bunch of exploration of trajectories. What happens if I do these, you know, over time, I change my knobs this way and then this way. So you have lots and lots of episodes of training and building up reward. And then over time, what you're seeing here is this thing gets better and better at learning how to do it, uh, control itself. And the reward structure then over many, many episodes gets up to be quite high. And you can see that the loss function there in the bottom starts to get quite low. So it very quickly starts, well, not quickly. It takes quite a bit of, uh, a, quite a bit of simulation here, right? But of course, in the real laser system, the, the, this might actually go a lot faster because there's no simulation time, right? The, the mode lock laser, it, it locks almost, you know, in microseconds. And so you could get, um, you can get new data as fast as you can make changes in your, in your, um, in your actuation of those wave plates and polarizers, which are on the more on the scale of, uh, subseconds. So what it starts to do is, uh, it's, it can optimize this because Essentially, what reinforcement learning is very good at is characterizing delayed rewards. So in other words, I'm not looking to take the next step that's best. I'm looking to take a set of steps that optimizes my reward. So it can have this delayed reward structure. And this is really important because that's the power of reinforcement learning is the delayed reward. And this is what we do as humans, right? It's not about like, I want to make a move that optimizes my next step. I want to take a trajectory so that I get to my objective at the end of a certain number of steps. And reinforcement learning is kind of unique in this sense, because what it allows you to do is formulate the objective function exactly in that way, which is I can basically push out, I have an integrated reward structure over time, allowing me to get to that reward. And so, for instance, here's three different configurations, each one of them for different uh, angle settings. It learns how to, let's say, take a number of steps to get itself into the best mode locking state. So you look at the rewards function there, notice in the bottom trajectory there, it actually walks out of the red region where it's not mode locked right into the good region where it's mode locked. This, this case is a little simple, but the idea is it takes a number of episodes to get out of there and get itself into a position of maximal reward. And here is the most, I think, um, I think of this as a sort of impressive. Uh, I don't, <laughs> maybe you don't think of it as impressive, but many of us who work in optical systems understand the concept of a bi-stability, right? We, we see this in all these systems, right? Where we have, for a given parameter state, you have multiple solution branches. And this is sort of canonical in complex dynamical systems. Most of the uh, automated tuning algorithms and control algorithms don't know how to recognize bistabilities. And what reinforcement learning does, it actually can learn bistability and bistable structures. So this is really important in these optical systems. And I'm showing you one example of it on the bottom left there, which is there is a parameter regime where the, op where the mode lock state is maximal. But if you just simply take your wave plates and polarizers and move to that regime in a straight fashion, which is path number two there, 
then it doesn't mode lock. What you have to actually do, because it's a bistable structure, the zero solution is stable, but there's also a mode lock state, which is stable. So what you have to do to get to that solution that you want, you have to walk around in parameter space. In other words, there's a cliff right there or a bistable structure. You have to walk around it to the top. And that's exactly trajectory one. The delayed reward structure of reinforcement learning allows you to learn how to walk around that structure so that now you're on top of this structure, which means it's the mode lock state, which is uh, the, the one state there, uh, which is the mode lock state. Whereas if you just walk straight to that parameter regime, it's not mode locked. So this is a really important aspect of the reinforcement learning. It can actually capture these very nicely. Um, by the way, we can combine part one of this talk with part three, which is the reinforcement learning. You could have this reinforcement learning agent learn how to walk you up towards these solutions. And then you can turn on your extremum seeking control. So as the, as the, as the parameters might shift underneath you, like the buyer fringes is wandering, you just simply stay on it with your extremum seeking control. So there's no reason why you wouldn't, in fact, use multiple control architectures jointly together. And here what we're showing is a way to use the deep reinforcement learning agent to learn how to get yourself to the landscape and how to mode lock the laser cavity. And then you just use extreme seeking control to keep you in sort of the optimal state, even as parameter variations happen in your laser cavity. Uh, and also you have a you have a representation just like we did with deep MPC. You have a, uh, a way to learn latent variables. And in fact, the way we did this in this, this is now some of the more details of, of this laser cavity configuration is we use convolutional autoencoders to learn the feature spaces that we are, we're using to actually get us up uh, to learn these pathways and trajectories, okay? So this deep reinforcement learning agent is actually quite rich it's, again, it's black box, so it's a little bit harder to interpret, but it works amazingly well. And specifically, we use this, what's called a deep Q learning um, to do this, which is sort of a, you know, it's, it's kind of what the field is often using these days uh, in terms of uh, when, you, when you do deep reinforcement learning, often much of it is, is around Q learning in these physics, in physics and engineering systems. And again, these are just learning neural network representations that map you into some coordinate space where you can construct um, your, your solutions. By the way, um, all of this can be ported to other architectures. We've just done a little bit with metamaterial antennas and self-tuning of metamaterial antennas. And the only reason I show this is because there is nothing special about that mode lock laser. Uh, it was just simply for us, it's a really nice, easy, way to parametrize or build these models because you know we can produce our i don't have an experiment so that's that's like my experimental test bed and it has all the right features right it has an unknown latent variable space which is given by the bifringence i have multiple inputs trying to control it i have a nice objective function but in any of these other systems once you have those you can also do this kind of control architecture uh there's a bunch of work we've done on this and you know all the code's available so uh, if you want to download some of this code and play around with it with your optical system, like I said, all you need is you need to be able to give the code the objective function and your actuations. And here for these, the actuations are the wave plates and polarizers. The objective function is, um, is, 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 is just basically the energy divided by the fourth moment of spectrum. And within this structure, then you can build out these architectures. And so hopefully that will be something that, so if any of you are interested, you can follow up on this. And um, yeah, that's about it. I think I'm finishing pretty close on time because I started early. So I guess with that, uh, let's go ahead and I guess take questions or if anybody has any. All right, thank you very much. That was a really, really nice presentation. Uh, or I so, guess here's uh, a Q&A question. I got to pull up the Q&A. Should I just go ahead and read it? Uh, thank Benjamin. All right. All right. So, oh, okay. That's, okay. Okay. I didn't understand the tutorial search. Uh, 
is this a physics intuition or a trade-off between time and performance? Yeah, so what the Toyota search is, uh, let me explain a little bit. So I have, let's say I have to, so with the Toyota search, the, our, our, our justification of the Toyota search is that if we have a two-dimensional parameter space, we have to map out. The nice thing about the parameters we have, they're periodic, right? So the alpha one and alpha two go from zero to two pi. Those wave plates have a two pi circular. And then the question is, how do I map out that space spanned by alpha one and alpha two? What's the best ideal way to do it? Since they're both periodic, you can think of this thing being on a torus. Like if I move alpha one direction and alpha two direction, and what I want to do, if I want to sample all of that space on the torus, you essentially, let's say, make alpha one change by some frequency omega one, and you make alpha two change by some frequency omega two. And if you make them essentially incommensurate, and irrationally related, it will basically map out over time the entire torus. So that's that's the idea is to basically do parametric sweeps of these underlying parameters uh, that that we have. So that that hopefully that helped explain it a little bit. But we have to do it in four dimensions, right? So you and that was for the first case where we had to say I have to map out, I have to create a map of this high dimensional parameter space of where mode locking occurs or doesn't occur so that I can understand the landscape. So instead of me walking up a local hill, in other words, a local maximum, I want the global maximum. So I map this out and I can get an understanding of what the global maximum is. Okay, uh, here's the question. I didn't understand how you are tracking the biofringence. Uh, is it a stochastic event? Do we have an adaptive filter? Uh, Okay, so let's start with biofringence. So the biofringence is something we don't know. So it's an unmeasured variable. Of course, in, in the modeling, I actually specify, I make it a stochastic varying uh, variable, but I never have access to it from the point of view of measurements. So mostly what we're trying to do is trying to build a model. So there's this underlying biofringence that's basically destroying mode locking, or having the laser come into mode locking, I have no model for it, for how it's evolving. So I need to take from the data itself, I need to adjust for the changes of the stochastically varying biofringence. So I never track it. And in fact, what we normally do is we just learn some model representation of the biofringence that we never directly measure. And in fact, a lot of optical systems are like this, right? There's a lot of variables that you, you, don't, you don't actually measure them. You can't measure them, right? And so, but they have a huge impact on your performance. And so you need to learn some kind of representation of, of it, uh, this latent variable in this mapping. And all these models actually do exactly that. They learn some representation of it uh, in, in the model. So there was a question that was posted in the other forum and I think that Sergey wants to talk. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, I would ask quickly the, the question that was uh, asked to the panelists. Can you explain the advantages to use reinforcement learning in systems which show this stability? Oh, uh, so can I explain the advantages of reinforcement learning? So I, I think reinforcement, okay. So let's talk about the strengths of reinforcement learning and the weaknesses. Reinforcement learning is amazing and works really well provided you can turn that laser into an interpolation engine. What I mean by that is if you can allow your system to explore all the possible dynamics, then reinforcement learning learns all these possible pathways. So, it's, so if you look at where reinforcement learning has been very successful, the game of Go, the game of chess, all of these are things where you can basically map out all possible behaviors. Where reinforcement learning does not work well is when you, when you're, if your physics moves into a regime that's outside of your training set. So this is what happens in uh, self-driving cars. Do you remember this accident that happened a year and a half ago, two years ago? There was a pedestrian or a, there was a cyclist slash pedestrian that was killed by a self-driving car in Pittsburgh. And it turned out what had happened was 
the person was walking on the side of the road with their bike on their shoulder and they were running. And the machine learning didn't know what this was, didn't know how to react to it. It wasn't in the training set. It got labeled as a bag and the car ran this person over, killed this person. So the good thing about reinforcement learning is that will never happen again, right? Because now what you'll do is you'll train the model <laughs> with a bunch of labeled data that says, this is a person running on the side of the road with their bike, drive around them. Okay, but everything that's not in the training data, reinforcement learning does not know how to handle it. So if you have the mode lock laser, I think you can actually map out almost all possible behaviors. So reinforcement learning will work well there. But if you're going to use reinforcement learning to try to extrapolate, it will probably break for sure, I think. I hope that uh, answers that. Sir, you got a question. Yeah. yeah um just in the spirit of the uh, summer school, can I be a little bit provocative? Oh, yes, so, uh, please. F first of all, excellent lecture. So uh, I I'm trying just to be provocative to, yes, to, yes. to, to get a little bit more. So, uh, yes, uh, if, uh, if you think about these NPE-based lasers, Frank Weiss always said it is, it is really good. It is simple that, but they have multiple... Uh, operational regimes and uh, they are detuned. So now with your device, are, are you telling us everything or you hide something? Because it looks like with your approach, it is the problem is solved and they can be indeed self-tuned or there is some still some challenge to, to resolve. Sorry uh, for the question. Yeah. You no, know, no, this is a great question. So I, I think your question actually, in my view, goes to the objective function. The real question is, you know, optics is fast and you can't measure the electric field, right? Direct. I mean, okay, if you want to spend a lot of effort trying to actually pull out the pulse profile, but really what you get is the spectrogram. And the, the real question that came about is, when you measure that objective function, it's not probably that hard to measure uh, the fourth moment of the spectrum, but what kind of time scales are you getting this on, right? Because the laser is so fast. So in, in my view, everything is there except for maybe, is it realistic, the objective function that we've put there? You know, for us building the, the numerical model, it's easy to compute this, right? But in an experiment, you're actually not computing the instantaneous fourth moment in energy in the cavity, you're computing it after like millions of round trips. Does that work? Like, can you use that objective function, which is some kind of average, statistical average over all these round trips? So the question of that is, I think, is a little bit unknown. The way that a lot of these laser people handle this, right, is once they get it working, they they seal it environmentally, right? They It's temperature control. It's, it's glued into place so that so that the biofringe can't change. But in Frank's lab, it changes. And so they just go back and retune it, right? But sometimes they'll put a cardboard box on it to try to make it environmentally <laughs> better. But it's like, you know, I, I figure if they're doing that, then they should try to, to do something a little fancier <laughs> than cardboard okay, box. No, 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 I, I understand. That's a great answer oh. because uh, yes, in laboratory, indeed, you can measure everything and you can adjust. But what you really want, you want this laser to work without these measurements. And yeah. so basically, yeah. we need some simple measurements, yeah. cheap measurements, which will allow us to trigger this feedback. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and, good, and that's a point to think about. Yeah. Even for a lot of the optical communications you guys think about. So I know there's some people here that think about, like, let's say long haul com communications. And I want to do some machine learning there, even if I want to tune it. When you take a measurement, you know, you're taking a statistical measurement, right? You're, you're like, okay, I, I took a second of data, which is, you know, whatever. It's, it's a lot of data, right? That's 10 to the nine or 10 to the 12 bits, right? So you're not getting like, how did, how did a bit come through? You're getting, how did 10 to the nine bits come through? The question is, if you could construct a good objective function for those kind of statistical quantities, I'm pretty sure this stuff would work. Um, I just haven't been able to figure out like, what can you actually do on measurement? And then there's a control time. What's the delay in the control time? And you have to have whatever 
things you're trying to account for be moving faster or, or sorry, they have to be changing slower than your control time. There's a latency for that control too. So yeah, yeah latency is key. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there's a few bunch of other question. Uh, would you have another two, three minutes or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. so, so I'm gonna turn backwards and go from Mehdi Mabed. Uh, in reinforcement learning, how do you calculate, uh, evaluate the loss function, not for where you are, but where you will be in the next few steps? So actually, uh, essentially in the reinforcement learning agent, you just give it, it just takes, it takes trajectories. It doesn't actually compute where it's gonna be. It just decides on, I'm gonna take a trajectory and what it does is it evaluates its objective function, which is integrated now over that entire trajectory. So in, when you do reinforcement learning, there's a bunch of trajectories that are off it, right? It's, it's a very brute force approach. It's kind of like us learning how to do things. We try a combinatorial large number of things and we decide, oh, I should try to do this. This is what works. Reinforcement learning is the same thing. You don't pre-compute where it's going to be. You simply let it take lots of trajectories and you have them all compute a score, which is what your accumulated, uh, uh, what's your cumulated, accumulated reward. And those who have a high cumulative reward, you now have trajectories that are kind of good candidates for the reinforcement learning agent. Juan has a question. Would it be worth combining MPC and extreme and seeking control? Uh, and linear embeddings. Oh yes, absolutely. So, you know, notice that many of the things I talked about today, we haven't incorporated with what I talked about yesterday, right? Which is what if instead I first took this laser cavity, which has nonlinear dynamics, and I try to learn a coordinate system to try to make it linear. And then maybe I just use the linear control, right? I mean, there's a lot of different architectures from yesterday to today. And what I think the most robust way to control this would bring in MPC, reinforcement learning, and the extreme of seeking control all together so that whenever one of them struggles, the other ones are there to kind of stabilize that system. So I think you can do a lot with doing combinations of controllers um, in a very good way there. Um, I think here, uh, can the model be applied or extended to other mode lock fiber lasers? Uh, graded index multi-fiber saturable absorber, figure eight laser. And I would say the answer is yes. Not only can you do to other mode lock lasers, but I think it's a just, again, any complex dynamical system where you have an ability to compute an objective function, you have ability to actuate, you know, I, I don't think there's anything special about that being a mode lock laser or, a, a, or stabilized by wave plates. I know how to modulate it. I know how to read out something I want. So for any of you who are working generically in photonic systems, this is just a generic paradigm of inputs to outputs on some nonlinear model that has latent variable representations that are hard. And so you have a generic infrastructure that it would allow you to essentially learn how to control that system. By the way, we've, like I said, uh, we actually applied the same kind of reinforcement learning and deep MPCs on rocket engines. So how do you stabilize rocket uh, combustion waves? And you can do this with the same architecture. It doesn't really care. It's physics agnostic. Just, just tell me what you can change. Tell me what to read out. And it will learn that model in between. Thank you very much. I just, Stefano, I just have one very small question in case nobody else is. Thank you, yeah, I, just, I just hope this rocket will not hit the guy with the bicycle. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think one of the interesting things, uh, I, I always like to have interpretable models. So I'm, I'm always, but I've taken a step over to have these black boxes. But my hope is, is for me personally, is to come back to what I talked about yesterday, which is how can I take these black boxes now and move them more towards this interpretability aspect so that you don't actually have this, right? Which is, oh, since I understand how it works, there's no chance for me hitting the guy on the bike, <laughs> right? That's the, that would be, I think, a great place for us to be is to combine the control, the interpretability, the parsimony together 
in a in a framework. So I think that's kind of uh, what we're headed towards next in all this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Probably. Just, yeah. Just a very small and uh, maybe stupid thing, right? Uh, you were mentioning the deep reinforcement learning and the way that you essentially can deal with instability playing around with back and forth aspects. What is not perfectly clear for me, right, is um, essentially you have your set of data or you position in the parameter space. So you have your vector of four parameters, the before and after state, essentially, right, that you can play around with. The question is, do you need to always, well, can you play either with a position in the, in the space, right, in the multiple like ND space in between, or can you actually apply the, the position of the fitness function in previous states to play with the bistability? So for instance, you're playing with the your objective function being the force derivative of the energy, give you the, the position of the, the dynamics, the dynamical state somehow of the system. So do you, can you reduce the dimensionality of the, you pass state toward the, the objective function that you're looking at essentially? Yeah, I actually think you could do something like that for sure. Um, and I think that would be sort of almost problem dependent. Anything that you have a pretty good understanding of, of how uh, a better variable representation, for instance, I think partly that's what you're partly asking, is there a better variable representation than this measurement? You could always transform it to that and then build all your models around what seems advantageous to you for sure. So um, again, this is so flexible of a paradigm, right? It doesn't really care that you're measuring the right physics. And that's one thing that's interesting that's kind of been hard for me personally, right? Which is up until I started working on this stuff, I always thought I have to measure the right variables or else how I'm going to do this. And what this is showing me is like, no, you just have to measure some representation of that variable somehow. It doesn't have to be a direct measurement. It can be sort of through this latent representation, but whatever this variable is doing shows up here in this other measurement space. And you just have to build a map from one to the other. And then you're, and these things seem to work really well. I mean, I, I, I just about fell out of my chair when, when that, when I showed you that birefringence, and then when you build that latent model representation in this big black box, I mean, this is just some huge machinery and out pops that green curve, which is like basically a birefringence. It was like, it figured it out somehow. I don't know how, but it did, right? So this is, these are the kind of things that I, I still think there's a lot of open questions on the machine learning side. And I actually think that we collectively as physicists, engineers, scientists, are going to be really because I think a lot of the computer scientists don't really care. They don't like. Uh, so you want to get your little buyer? Who cares? It works. Let's move to the next hard problem. And we're typically saying, well, actually, I really want to figure out how that works because that might help me do physics on a system where I really don't have very good understanding, especially like biology. I think biology is like this amazing place where there are no first principle models, right? There's no F equals MA physics there. It's a, but amazing multi-scale data that we don't even know the right variables to use. But this is starting to say, well, you don't, you took these measurements, but let me try to build you some models and some, here's some, here's some variables I found. Do they mean anything to you? They might, right? So. All right. Well, thank you very much for the answer and for the very Thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, I see it's dinner time again. I want to, uh, uh, margarita fungi uh, with a, a liter of red wine. <laughs> that would be perfect. Uh, we owe you nothing. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, guys. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Um, we, we will ship, a, a, send, give us a, your delivery address and we'll send you pizza. Yeah, right. we do. We do. <laughs> Good. All right. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. Um, yeah, so I think that's it uh, for today. So thank you uh, very much to all the speakers and all the audience that was here um, during the afternoon. Uh, so we'll close the session. I think we start tomorrow again at uh, nine, uh, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, yes, at nine again tomorrow. So thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Benjamin. Bye.